All right, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is Drew Lahart uh, from IBM Research. Uh, today we have uh, Anirban Laha from IBM Research. Uh, Anirban uh, is going to be the next uh, speaker in our AI Horizons uh, seminar series. Uh, Anirban uh, has a NORPS paper that he'll be presenting to us today on uh, controllable, sparse, excuse me, controllable sparse alternatives to softmax. Uh, it's quite a mouthful there. So, um, looking forward to, to hearing this seminar. Um, we can ask questions as we go. Uh, if, if possible, I prefer to hold them to the end to make sure that we have enough time for Anirban to get through his deck. Um, I will also uh, just remind you that um, this call is being recorded and it will be made available on the IBM Research YouTube channel uh, once it's completed. Uh, with that, let me turn it over to Anirban, uh, and uh, we'll get started. Thank you, Drew. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so today I'm going to present on control level sparse alternatives to SoftMax. So I think as we go through the presentation, all of these terms will get clearer. So this is a joint work with my collaborators from IBM Research India, as well as professors from IIT Madras. So I'll get started. So, uh, so this talk is about probability mapping functions. So what are probability mapping functions? So basically, these are functions which can take in any real vector and can try to convert them to probability distributions. So as in usual probability distributions, the elements of the vector, the resultant vector P, will conform to the properties of probabilities, like all of the values will be greater than or equal to zero and they will sum to one, right? So in this discussion, we are going to discuss about such functions which can take in any real score vector and produce a probability distribution out of it. So essentially what's happening here is given any point in the real space, so this kind of function which we represent as rho will transform such a point Z to a resultant point in the probability simplex. So here uh, in this illustrative diagram on the right, so we take a vector Z and transform it to a probability simplex on the 3D space, which is exactly a triangle. So we are going to discuss all such kinds of functions, rho, which can perform this kind of operation. So let's see if there are any such known probability mapping functions. There's one such very familiar function known as softmax, which we use in almost every other setting in machine learning. There are also other not so well-known probability mapping functions like sum normalization and theoretical softmax. Now, what are the applications they are used in? They, they are, so typically softmax is ubiquitous in almost all kinds of machine learning applications like probabilistic classification, be it multi-class or multi-level classification. It, it's also used in neural attention models, typically where soft attention mechanism is used, and also in memory networks, reinforcement learning, knowledge distillation, and so on many other such applications. So softmax is the most prevalent and uh, the others that I have mentioned are not so well used because softmax has very nice properties which, uh, which satisfies almost every other need. Now let's look at one application which is of interest that I'll be discussing today. So let's look at the image on the right. It is the image of a cockpit on an airplane so there are like a plethora of instruments and sensors which are actually visible, right? So a pilot who is handling the controls in the cockpit may not, uh, should not be overwhelmed by, by so many sensors and instruments, right? He needs to focus on only the ones which are important for a particular situation. Maybe only a few, like two or three sensors might be relevant during uh, takeoff or landing, right? So similarly, neural attention models try to attend to only uh, the parts of the input which are uh, relevant for certain situation, right? And so usually the way they do it is they usually apply a softmax function over the parts of the input and get probabilities uh, over the parts of the input and use those probability weights 
to have a weighted combination of the inputs, which is then passed to the next stage of the neural model. So typically, soft attention mechanisms use the softmax probability mapping function. Now, there are uh, the known probability functions that I have spoken about have certain limitations. Like, for example, the softmax function that we uh, see here, so it has the property that it always produces non-zero probabilities. That is because the numerator cannot produce a zero value because it's an exponential of uh, number zi, right? So we cannot get any sparse outputs because all of the values, no matter how low they are, they will always be greater than zero. Similarly, there are other issues with uh, the other functions like sum normalization. So the sum normalization is the function zi by summation zj. So here the issue is that it cannot take negative values of z. So if it does that, then the resultant output violates the constraint of probability distribution because the values end up being negative, right? Similarly, with spherical softmax, because of the square term there, so there's this issue of non-monotonicity. Now, so basically this talk will be about search of the right probability mapping functions with all the nice properties. So now why do we need sparsity? So last slide I spoke about that softmax cannot produce sparse outputs, right? Now, if we look at multi-level classification setting, so given an image of this car, right, there are uh, only a handful of labels which would be turned on. Only a, like maybe in this case, just five labels are true and the label space could be thousands or even millions, right? So only a few labels are true. So that's why we probably need a sparse probability mapping function to predict only the labels for which uh, non-zero is produced and the zeros are the irrelevant levels. Similarly, for attention models, so here uh, I have shown a textual entanglement task for representation. So basically, when trying to see when uh, if a pair of sentences like premise and hypothesis, if they are entailing uh, with each other or contradicting or so on. So given this hypothesis, only a few words in the premise might be relevant in predicting the output, right? So most of the words are not needed. Typically, if you apply a softmax function, what happens is uh, almost all the words are predicted non-zero. So the darker here shows the higher value of probabilities, while lighter shows lower value. So typically, it would be needed that uh, for the lighter shade, it should be exactly white, which means zero probability, because they are irrelevant. But still, because of limitations of softmax, they are also cropping up as lower shade here. So if we have uh, zero for the irrelevant words, we might actually be able to uh, make the computation faster. So whenever we use the probabilities as weights for linear combination of these words in the input. So the number of computations decrease if we have zeros for the irrelevant ones. So that's why sparsity is also desired in this setting, right? Now, where do we need sparsity? So uh, there's a paradigm of sparsity of model parameters, right? Let's uh, take a look at a simple model where the input is X and the output prediction is Y. Uh, so a simple linear model could be like Wx plus B, maybe followed by some nonlinearity, say rho, could produce an output Y, right? So typical sparsity uh, literature for model parameters try to deal with sparsity in the W. But in, in our setting here, we are looking at sparsity in the output, which is the probability vector that is produced, right? So uh, this is... Uh, different from the other sparsity literature that we have seen uh, so far in uh, our studies. So one easy, uh, one intuitive way to do it is probably if we can have a L1 norm regularizer on the output Y in the loss function, can, can we achieve sparsity in the output? The answer is no, because, so if we are dealing it output which are probabilities as the uh, 
maybe the softmax fun function or any probability mapping function would produce. So since it's probability, the L1 norm of probability distribution is always one, right? So we cannot have an optimization on top of that. So probably we need to look at a better mechanism of obtaining sparsity in the output, right? So there's already one prior work uh, called SparseMax, which came uh, in ICML 2016. So it has tried to address this concern where uh, to obtain a probability distribution P from a real vector Z, it would try to make uh, the probability distribution P sparse enough. The way it does is it tries to take the input vector Z and tries to find the nearest point on the probability simplex, which uh, is denoted as P, and it returns that as output. Now, it can be mathematically proven that the nearest point on the probability simplex corresponding to the point Z is actually a sparse probability distribution. Uh, so many of the uh, dimensions of P could be zero, unlike softmax. So there are very interesting properties about this transformation SMAX in a way that it can be easily computed as a closed form solution. Typically, the uh, way it could be done is there could be a threshold that needs to be found out here denoted as tau, and uh, we should fi fix the threshold tau at such a point that uh, we can compute the sparse max for each dimensions by this, and the sum of the sparse max for each dimensions turns out to be one, which is the property of the probability distribution. So this is the prior work in ICML 2016 paper. Now let's visualize how the sparse max function works. So let's consider a two-dimensional input vector, Z1, Z2, and as per our uh, requirement, we want to transform Z1, Z2 to a probability vector P1, P2 uh, with the uh, desired properties of probabilities, right? So uh, let's take uh, the real space, two-dimensional real space to represent Z1, Z2. So here Z1 is denoted by the x-axis, Z2 is denoted by the y-axis. And uh, so here the red regions are actually the Z1, Z2s, or the points in this real space, which can, if passed to the sparse max transformation, will produce a sparse vector, right? So what do I mean by sparse vector? So in two-dimensional space, sparse vector could be either one, zero, or zero, one. So all of these points in the red regions could be either one, zero, or zero, one, right? Whereas the, the regions in between, which are denoted by the contours that we can see, these are the areas where both P1 and P2 are non-zeros, right? So here the value of the contours show the value of the first dimension of the probability P1. So this is uh, one way to visualize this kind of transformation, right? So let's look at how the other known probability mapping functions that we have seen, how to visualize them in this way, right? So sparse max, as we have seen, this is how it looks like. The sparse regions are denoted by the red, and in between is the non-sparse region. Whereas in soft max, uh, once we have a visualization of the sparsity versus non-sparsity region, so as we have stated before, that soft max can't produce non-zero, uh, can't produce zero values. So indeed, it doesn't have any sparse region throughout the real space. So this contour line spread throughout the real space and there's no red region. Whereas for some normalization also, since it's valid only for the first quadrant, it cannot work for negative values. Still, even for the first quadrant, there's no red region, which means that it cannot produce sparse output even in the first quadrant where it's working, right? So, uh, and the other point here is, so this transformation functions do not have control over the sparsity. So uh, this is something that will get clearer in the next few slides. Now, uh, so how we actually incorporate control into a sparse probability mapping me mechanism. So we propose a framework called sparse gen, uh, 
which is a unified framework which is like uh, it can contain a f uh, fam so it's actually a family of sparse probability mapping functions the way it's defined is so taking an input z and uh, using a predefined uh, transformation function g uh, and with some parameter lambda so the way it's defined is as follows right so given an input z so it's passed through a transformation function which takes in a k-dimensional vector and produces a k-dimensional vector as output. That output vector of gz is projected onto the simplex like the sparse max function. The first part of the objective looks similar. Then once that is done, so this is followed by a negative L2 norm regularizer, which helps in also uh, uh, controlling the sparsity. So this uh, equation or the formulation can be also represented equivalently in a simpler form. So sparse gen of z, z uh, for a predefined function g and parameter lambda could also be denoted by sparse max of gz by 1 minus lambda. Now, if we have a closed form uh, uh, representation of gz, then we can ha easily have uh, close form representation of sparse gen as well because sparse max also has a close form solution as we saw before. Now, as I mentioned about controls of sparsity, uh, so there are two ways to control sparsity using this sparse gen framework. So one is through the gz functions. It's typically what kind of function g we can choose. The another way is the parameter lambda. So here in this, uh, we will talk about two very uh, derivatives of this kind of controls. So we propose two such uh, formulations. So one by changing only the lambda parameter, which is we call it sparse gen hyphen lin, and the other which uh, which we change by controlling only the gz uh, function, which we call a sparse hourglass. So these are just two variants that we propose, but since this is a family of uh, probability mapping functions, many other variants could be produced out of it. And in fact, uh, so we have shown that this framework is a generalization of all the other known probability mapping functions that we have seen till now. Now, so uh, as I mentioned, there are two ways to control sparsity, right? So one way of controlling sparsity is we call this formulation sparse gen lin. Uh, so lin because gz function is exactly same as z, it's just that the negative L2 norm regularizer here is uh, added to whatever we have seen before, right? So the benefit of uh, using this negative L2 norm regularizer is seen from the diagrams below. So when lambda is equal to zero, this formulation turns out to be exactly same as sparse max that we have seen before with the exactly same sparse regions and the contours. Whereas if we increase lambda to 0.5 on the right, so we see that the non-sparse uh, non region shrinks, which is the contours region has shrunk, whereas the sparse region has increased. Whereas if we decrease lambda to minus two, or even below. So we see the sparse region has shrunk, whereas the contoured region has increased. So this shows this lambda can actually control the width of the non-sparse region. Similarly, we propose another uh, variant called sparse hourglass. So the name uh, typically comes from the shape that we see uh, in the middle figure below, which is in the shape of an hourglass. So uh, so that uh, shape is controlled by a parameter called Q, which is found in this a little complicated formulation. I won't go into the uh, details of it. The derivation and everything can be found in our paper. So, uh, so only we should note that there's this parameter Q here at the denominator, which helps in controlling the shape of the non-sparse region. So here we can see that uh, in the middle figure uh, below, Right, so we have uh, the shape of the non-sparse region in the form of an hourglass. Now, uh, so that happens uh, like for a value of 
equal to 0.5. Now if we decrease q to 0, so this hourglass shape changes in a way that it, uh, the contour covers the whole of the first and the third quadrant, or rather uh, the last quadrant. Whereas if we uh, increase Q to infinity, we get exactly same as fast max. So this is one, uh, Q is another way to control the shape of the non-sparse region and hence control the sparsity. Now I'll discuss two important properties of probability mapping functions that, that are desired. Right? So one is called translation invariance. So this property states that Starting with a real vector z, if we get a probability distribution p as output, so if we add uh, a same constant c to all the dimensions of z, we should still get back the same probability distribution that we've seen before. So if such a property is holding, then it's called translation invariant. So essentially adding the same constant to all the dimensions of z, doesn't change the output probability distribution. That's the idea of translation invariance. So typically this translation invariance is seen in some of the known uh, probability mapping functions like sparse max, soft max, and also uh, the sparse chain lin that we have defined just now. Similarly, there's another property called scale invariance, which is observed by a couple of other known uh, functions like sum normalization and spherical softmax. So the idea here is instead of adding constant to every dimension of z, if we multiply a constant to every dimension of z, and if we end up getting the same output probability distribution, then it's called the scale invariance property, which is satisfied in this case, right? So these are two different kinds of properties uh, which are shown by different uh, probability mapping functions that we have seen till now. Now, sparse hourglass that we have defined in a couple of slides before has an interesting connection between these two properties. So the parameter Q that I was talking about uh, in this slide can be used to control the shape of the hourglass that I have shown before, but this Q can also, uh, so when Q is equal to zero, so it can be shown that the formulation actually satisfies the scale invariance property, which is on the right. Whereas if Q is tending to infinity, in this case, exactly equal to sparse max, if it's equal to infinity, then uh, the translation invariance property is satisfied as in the case of sparse max. So this Q parameter can essentially bridge the gap between these two uh, properties, scale and translation invariance, which is an interesting property. Now, uh, so I have discussed a couple of formulations which uh, can be used as a probability mapping function, right? Now, as you might recall during the uh, slide for uh, the uh, cockpit of an airplane, so there I pointed out that softmax is used for computing probability distribution over the uh, instruments, right, in the cockpit, right? So that's how the neural attention mechanism works. So instead of softmax, if we replace by any other probability mapping function, so uh, then also we could have an attention mechanism, right? So here, if we look at this figure in as encoder decoder kind of setup, for every state of the decoder, we have a sparse attention or an attention mechanism defined over the inputs, which is the states of the encoder, right? So typically, instead of using a softmax to compute probability over the states of the encoder, we could use any other probability mapping function as we have defined, right? So if we just replace softmax there with sparse max or sparse gen lin or sparse hourglass, we could have a like a sparse attention mechanism. So we have tried this out uh, like for a couple of settings in sequence to sequence kind of models. One is neural machine translation, another is abstractive summarization. So the results that we have seen here uh, are promising. So if we look at the translation setting, 
So we have reported the blue scores, whereas for the summarization setting, we have reported the root scores, typically root one, root two, and root L. And so uh, the main highlight of uh, this table is, so one of our uh, defined formulations, fast gen lane, uh, does pretty well across uh, multiple tasks through most of this matrix, whereas uh, the sparse hourglass is actually comparable. Uh, so, uh, the, but the uh, main uh, key finding here is that even though this is a highly non-convex setting being encoder decoder setup uh, with many layers and uh, attention mechanism defined, still uh, controlling the lambda parameter for sparse gen lin, we are able to get sparser attention vectors, right? So if you look at the figure at the bottom, so we show in the x-axis uh, increasing lambda starting from minus 1000 to 0.75, and the y-axis shows the non-zeros, the number of non-zeros in the attention heat map averaged over the test set, right? So uh, we see that increasing the lambda indeed decreases the number of non-zeros or makes the attention vector sparser which is not surprising, but it's actually good to see that it's holding true in a non-convex setting. And even with the non-lambda uh, control, we are also able to uh, get uh, like better blue scores and root scores uh, across certain settings. Now, uh, the next uh, problem that I am going to discuss is the multi-level classification. So uh, typically, what is multi-level classification? So in case of classification, we uh, usually see uh, for a particular instance vector, there's a particular class being predicted as true, right? Whereas in the case of multi-level classification, uh, for a particular instance, there could be more than one levels which are true. Uh, for instance, uh, let's look at this image of a landscape. Uh, so many of the labels which I have marked on the right uh, are actually true for this image, right? Trees, hills, grass, and so on, right? So this is a typical multi-level classification setting. Whereas the, uh, so there's another point to be noted here is that the label space for multi-level classification could be uh, anything. It could be thousands or uh, even millions but more than one of the labels of them are true, but few of them are true, right? So usually uh, typical approaches of solving multi-level classification is for every label in the uh, label space, there's a classifier that is being trained. For example, there's a tree classifier, there's a greenery classifier, there's a grass classifier. So if there are millions of uh, labels in the label space, for each of them, there's a classifier that needs to be trained. And then whichever classifier fires, so those uh, outputs uh, are actually considered and that corresponding labels are considered as predicted true. So this is one way to approach multi-level classification. And as we see, there are multiple shortcomings in this. So the number of classifiers are uh, exactly proportional to the number of labels in the label space. And also each classifier is independent of the other label classifier. So uh, we are going to consider another approach that is also known in uh, literature. It was defined in uh, the ICML 2016 paper that I mentioned earlier. So here what happens is given the image, there's a single classifier which tries to score each uh, labels in the label space. And then uh, once we have the score vector over the label space, we could apply a probability mapping function. Typically, if we apply a sparse probability mapping function like sparse max or uh, sparse gen lin or sparse hourglass as we saw, we would get outputs like where uh, for the labels which need to be predicted to true, the output probabilities would be non-zero and for the others, the output would be zero. So it's a much simpler uh, way to actually consider multi-level approach where uh, the probability mapping function only uh, selects the ones which are uh, need to be predicted true and the others are zeros. Uh, 
right? So here again, there's a single classifier that is used. And uh, so the parameters are shared across the label space. Now, uh, even though we are going to follow that approach, there's a, a difficulty in training that kind of a model. Uh, so, uh, so for training a model, we'll have the input and uh, probably the label, uh, which is the label vector over the label space. So typically the model will learn the score vector Z followed by the probability mapping function to produce the uh, probability distribution as we saw, the sparse probability distribution. And the sparse probability distribution need to match with the label vector uh, consisting of only the true levels marked as non-zero and the other levels marked as zero. But training this kind of loss function, it can be uh, theoretically shown that it's difficult to produce, a, a, it's not possible to produce a convex model objective or define any convex loss function if we have this kind of a setup. Now, uh, there's a workaround uh, to actually train in this kind of setup. So the way we do it is, uh, instead of uh, applying, so during training time, instead of applying probability mapping function on the score vector, so uh, there's a way to define the loss function, which essentially captures uh, the essence of the mapping function that we would have used otherwise. So the loss function itself takes the score vector and it encodes some properties of the probability mapping function that we uh, desire. So it takes the real vector and tries to compute loss with the label vector, considering the probability mapping function that we desire, right? So this is the way to train that we adopt in this paper, whereas uh, during, uh, so uh, it can be shown that using this formulation, it's still possible to object, a, uh, it's still possible to obtain a convex model objective. But so that's something that's done during the training time, whereas during the inference time, since there's no convex objective needed, so we can directly apply the probability mapping function and we don't need to apply any loss function. Right, see the probability mapping function uh, itself produces the sparse probability distribution which could be used for model prediction. So uh, typically for the two formulations that we have defined, which is sparse gen lin and sparse hourglass, we were able to uh, formulate and propose convex loss functions which are based on the hinge loss idea. So we were able to uh, create convex loss functions, which when fitted into this kind of framework, uh, made it possible to form a convex model objective. So, uh, so I won't go into the details of this loss functions, the way they are derived. So the details uh, can be found in our paper. But one, one thing to note here again, the loss function takes input only the uh, real vector Z and the label vector uh, eta, and this loss uh, function some way encodes some properties of the probability mapping function. Uh, in this case, is the sparse gen lin or the sparse hourglass, such that during inference time, we could directly apply the probability mapping function. So we have applied uh, this kind of losses for uh, a synthetic uh, data for multi-level classification. So we have tried to uh, compare the uh, setup of like sparse gen lin, sparse hourglass, and the existing sparse max and soft max. So we try to compare them how they fare against this multi-level uh, experimental setup on this synthetic data set. So, uh, so one thing to note here is, as I mentioned, multi-level uh, data sets can have uh, more than one level predicted true for a particular instance, right? So uh, the way we build this synthetic data set is the number of labels which are true for a particular instance. Uh, so we try to vary the mean number of labels over the whole data set uh, just to compare and see, uh, just to observe the behavior of all of these competing models. 
Similarly, we try to uh, vary the range of the uh, number of labels over the whole data set. And also we try to vary the document length. So typically this synthetic data set is made out of a combination of words. So we try to uh, vary the number of words, which is the document length. So, uh, so these are the different kinds of analysis we try to do, like varying the mean number of labels over the whole data set, varying the uh, variance of the labels and, and uh, the document length. And we try to observe how the competing models fare. And now one thing to note about how this competing models are represented. So as I mentioned in the earlier slide that there's a loss function applied directly to the score vector, uh, whereas during the inference, there's no loss function, there's a probability mapping function, right? So, uh, so that's why I have denoted the competing models as a pair, which is the loss function, which is after the plus sign, and the probability ma uh, mapping function, which is before the plus sign. So it's a pair of model that way, right? So, so typically what would be done uh, is that during training time, we would train with the corresponding loss, uh, as I have mentioned, like hinge or Hoover or log loss. Whereas at the inference time, so the corresponding probability mapping function would be used to get the sparse output. Now let's look at how the results look like in multi-level classification setting. So as I uh, mentioned, there are multiple variants of the data set we have used where we try to vary the mean number of labels or the vary the range of the number of labels or document length. So these are the corresponding plots at the top of the slide. Uh, so each uh, plot shows the F score uh, compared with the mean for the number of labels in the first figure and similarly uh, for the range in the second figure and so on. Let's look at the first figure. So here we are uh, showing the competing setup like softmax plus log or sparse hourglass plus hinge and so on. So, uh, so we see the black and the violet uh, plots uh, which are consistently doing better across varying uh, number of labels. Whereas for the other two baselines, they are catching up only when the number of labels are higher. So this shows that if we have very sparse labels, which is denoted by lower number of mean labels, so still we are able to get uh, sparse outputs and hence accurate outputs, which is denoted by higher F score. Similarly, if we look at the second figure uh, at the top, we see that varying the range, uh, even then we see consistently higher performance of F1 scores. So, uh, and similarly, we see it for uh, varying document length. So one conclusion I want to draw from here is, uh, so even though there's a high variability in the number of labels in the data set, or even if there's a very less number of labels which are true. So the mechanisms that we proposed uh, are able to adapt to those kind of variability in the data set and are able to get sparser outputs when required, which also ends up boosting the accuracy. So that is seen by the figure at the bottom, right? So the top figures, they actually show accurate predictions in terms of the F scores. Whereas the lower figure shows that, so the black and the uh, violet lines are actually lower, which shows that there's lower number of non-zeros, which means sparser outputs are getting propose, uh, produced whenever it's needed, right? So these are the two conclusions that we can draw from here. Now, so uh, Coming towards the end of my presentation, so I, sh I would like to summarize the key contributions uh, of this work. So firstly, we have proposed a unified framework for sparse probability mapping functions, which we have called sparse gen. So we have then derived a couple of formulations, sparse gen lin and sparse hourglass. Uh, those are derived from the sparse gen for formulation, which was a unified framework. So these two formulations, sparse gen lin and sparse hourglass, uh, 
provides control over sparsity through different parameters. And also in the multi-level classification setting, we were able to propose convex hinge-based loss functions for these two formulations. Through experiments in the multi-level classification, we have shown sparser and more accurate predictions over synthetic data sets. We have also tried it on uh, some real data sets which were available. We have seen uh, comparable results. And also in the uh, attention setting, uh, like for neural machine translation and abstractive summarization, we have shown the effectiveness of sparsity control over attention heat maps. So these are the main uh, summary of uh, this uh, presentation. And so these are the references, uh, mainly the ICML 2016 paper, uh, which proposed PassMax. And then there was uh, an ICLR 2016 paper, which uh, spoke about the necessity uh, of uh, trying to debate whether scale invariance is necessary or translation invariance. So we have provided a mechanism in this paper through uh, sparse R glass, which tries to bridge the gap between scale and translation invariance. And there was also another paper in NIPS 2017, which also tried to produce a regularized framework for sparse and neural attention. So, uh, so as I come towards the end of my talk, I want to notify all the listeners about an event that's happening next month. So all, uh, so we are organizing a natural language generation tutorial at ACL 2019 next month. So if any of you guys are attending ACL and interested in natural language generation, please do drop by at this tutorial. So with that, um, uh, I'll be taking questions. Thank you, Uh, uh For anyone interested in asking questions, uh, just a reminder that we are uh, recording the session. It will be available on YouTube afterwards. Um, the, all of the speakers or all of the uh, participants at this point are on mute. So if you'd like to ask a question, please come off mute and ask your question now. Okay, I'm not seeing any, and I don't see any in the chat either. Uh, one more query. Any any questions from any of the participants? Okay, Anirban, thank you so much. Uh, just a reminder: uh, our next AI Horizon seminar is uh, on June 11th at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, it is a large-scale corpus for conversation disentanglement, and it'll be uh, Jonathan Comerfield from University of Michigan presenting. Uh, Anirban, thank you for your time. Everyone, thank you for listening. And thank see you. you. We'll thank see you, the next you for hosting me. Thanks a lot. Sure. No problem. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.